Hello. Hi, Austin Springer. Yes, it's Tim. This is Steve Juin from MMA Mania. Thanks for taking some time today to chat. Hey, no problem. I appreciate the phone call. All right. Well, then let's get right into it. Just want to start out with a little background on your career because uh, I got some notes from Mike, and it says that you wrestled in high school. So did you know even back then that you were going to get into MMA, or was it just the thing to do at the time? Uh, I didn't, you know. I uh, I had goals and aspirations of winning a state championship at wrestling in college. and uh, you know, different stuff was going on in my life, and I, I kind of, I didn't live up to the goals that I had set for myself, and, you know, my head was kind of in a weird place. My, uh, my mom and stepdad had recently become addicted to methamphetamine, and they were going back and forth, and I didn't want to go off to college, and they're trying to get that all sorted out, so I denied the uh, scholarships that were offered, and I uh, started training at a local MMA gym that was in town. So basically, even though, you know, you had to decline the scholarship opportunities, you still had some fire in you that, you know, I can't, I can't go to college and be a wrestling champion, but I can still be a champion in fighting. Yeah, I, I still have that itch to, to compete, to train. Uh, you know, that stuff is still nagging at me every day as I sat on the couch doing nothing. And I was like, you know, uh, I was at a point where I was working, you know, 12 to 15 hour construction job and I was wanting to train and I... I knew there was no way that my boss was just going to let me off early, so I just kind of had to finally say, all right, screw it. I'm going to you know, go in even if I'm tired, even if I'm sore and worn out. I, I need to talk about doing it, or I can do it. I, so <laughs> well, that's kind of what happened. That, that seems to be the story for a lot of people who get their start in MMA, is they have to work a day job and go to the gym at night all beat up and worn out. But it, that's the early drive. If you put that work in early, it tends to pay off later on. And you've been undefeated, so it obviously has been paying. Yeah, it's been working out for me so far. Yeah. Now, I guess at some point then, after you were training locally, you went to Extreme Couture, but I don't know the exact timeline of when you left and went to that gym. You know, it's got to be around uh, 2007 is when I did that. Uh, 2007, and then I was there for about six months. I started working at the gym, doing a little coaching there, uh, and then a, a Randy decided to pull the plug on it, and so another gym moved into that space uh, called Brave Heart Fight Club. Uh, it was the gym where Mike Pierce, Rick Story, uh, a couple of the notable pros were, were training out of, and I started managing that gym, uh, and I just hated the attitude of the owner. He's a very negative person like, as you're training. I'm all about constructive criticism, building someone up, and he's out there, I mean, I probably haven't met a worse person in my life. He's out there calling guys pussies and bitches and faggots because they're not working hard wow. enough. And I'm like, you know, this is not the environment that I want. This is this type of stuff is not okay. I don't want to be associated with this. And that's, you know, reasons why Ricky and Mike also left down the road, too. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of stories about when Mike Pierce was talking about uh, the owner having Ricky knock out uh, guys that were you know, already had head trauma. Like he had Ricky knocked me out when I was, you know, I'm a 135 or 145 and I was an amateur at the time and he's having Rick Story knock me out in practice. Uh, and it was just not a, a good fit for me, obviously. And so I took a little bit of time off to kind of stole that passion that I had and I slowly got back to it, started working at another gym, managing it. And then uh, I got to where I was kind of my own head coach and I realized, you know, to get to that next level that, I need to go outside of that, and so that's when I started training at Rose City Fight Club in Portland, and with guys like Pat Healy, Dave Jansen, Mike Pierce, a bunch of Bellator and UFC guys to kind of birds of the feather flock together. So I can't try and get myself to a world championship. I need the help of other coaches and training partners. Yeah, well, obviously that uh, worked out well because it got you an eventual Bellator debut at Bellator 101, but before I get to that, I just want to backtrack to something you don't have any animosity towards Randy Couture for pulling the plug on the gym, right? It sounds like the new ownership was the problem, not anything that he left in place before he left. Well, actually, so what it was, basically, the the, run, the story that I've been given is that he, he wanted to basically franchise him. And so he said, you know, hey, you guys manage this. Uh, I believe the story was that he wanted a, a gym in the Pacific Northwest so that, you know, his family was kind of based out of there and so when he came up he could pop in but 
he never really had any presence in the gym. Uh, I know the rent was really, really high there. Um, and, you know, there's no marketing, no advertising for the common person. You know, moms and dads and kids didn't know about it. I knew about it because, you know, I, I train, I'm in the fight game, so I looked up what gyms are local and found that. But uh, it just, you know, it financially wasn't making sense for him. And so I, I was, you know, business owner myself now and running a gym. I understand, you know, he had to make the hard decision to pull the plug. And so he closed down and then Pat White and Brave Legion went to that uh, landlord and said, hey, we want to open our own gym in this space. So they didn't. So they basically just yeah. took over the space. They didn't, there was no transfer. It was, they just took the Correct. same space. Correct. I got you now. So, yeah, Randy, Randy is absolved from anything that went on after they, uh, New ownership took over the building, so that's that's Absolutely good to know. Correct. Yeah, because you wouldn't expect that from the natural anyway. He would want safe training and good training partners and good procedures in place. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, back to Bellator. I assume that some of those connections you made after you left Braveheart were what led to you making your Bellator debut. Yeah, uh, it was actually you know Dave Jansen. He had just won the uh, the lightweight tournament and. They knew that they were coming to Portland, and they reached out to him and said, "Hey, you know, we're looking for a couple of local guys that, uh, you know, can compete at this level." And he gave my name, and uh, Ian Matthews from Bellator called me. You know, we talked about different opponents, and uh, was able to, you know, we actually went back and forth. We had a couple of guys back out. You know, I think as close as two weeks from the fight, so there's a, a very small possibility at one point that I wasn't actually going to be able to even compete on the card unless they found someone, and so. At the time, I was, I believe I was only 2-0, and but uh, 2-0 and or 3-0, I think I was 3-0. and um, And, you know, the guy they got brought in had over 15 fights uh, professionally, and, uh, you know, it wasn't going to stop me. I, I wanted to, I knew I could compete on that stage. Uh, when I competed at the Washington State Wrestling Tournament, Washington State at, at the time had the largest national state tournament. It's in the Tacoma Dome with, you know, over... 10 or 15,000 people in there, so I'm used to competing in front of large crowds, and so I, I perform best when the lights are the brightest, so I was really excited about the fight. I knew I was going to have a good performance. My training was on point, uh, and it showed in that fight. You know, afterwards, uh, Bjorn, who was still running it back then and one of the matchmakers, went up to my coach and said, you know, was definitely fight of the night. They were a little disappointed that I didn't get to finish. They felt I could have, and had I, they would have given me, you know, a contract. But I had let what others had told me about my opponent that he's really tough to finish. He's terrible. You know, don't blow your gas tank trying to finish him. And so I let that kind of get in my head, and I missed a couple opportunities that I probably could have taken and could have won the fight with. Uh, but all in all, I was happy with my performance. Well, yeah, no shame in your game. One of the judges even gave you a 10-8 for one of those rounds. So it was pretty clear yeah. domination of Zach Skinner. I, I don't think there was any doubt who the winner was after the decision. Yeah. So it's kind of a shame that they didn't see that, you know, immediately sign this kid and keep him around for a while. But do you feel like, you know, with the way your career has continued to progress, you're 7-0 and now and you got this co-main event against Ryan Mulvihill this weekend that – Maybe Bellator is still keeping an eye on you? Uh, you know, they could be. Um, I've been talking with my manager and agent. Uh, you know, he's getting calls about every week from Sean Shelby or Joe Silva and not taking anything away from Bellator. You know, they're obviously a great company, but, uh, UFC is the goal short term. You know, obviously the championship is long term, but I'd much rather go that route than going back down to Bellator. But if, you know, something happens and the UFC says, hey, our roster's too full right now, you know, it'll be six to 12 months before we sign any new guys or something along those lines, yeah, I would definitely uh, look towards Bellator. But, uh, you know, everybody wants to play in the NFL, not in the Canadian Football League. Oh, I understand. You'll you'll take the best opportunity that's available. You're just, you're keeping all of your options open. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Okay, well, that's good. And speaking of which, you know, this obviously is a good option for you this weekend since it's going to be featured on GoFightLive.tv and get a lot more people to see you. So what do you expect in the fight with Ryan Mulvihill? What's what's his biggest strength and what what do you think you bring to the fight that he can't handle? Without sounding 
overly confident. So I'm definitely not. Uh, I respect his skills. I respect what he brings to the table, but I believe that there's different levels of fighters, and I believe that I'm a notch or two above him in all areas. He's a tough fighter. I feel like I'm tougher. He's a good grappler. I feel like I'm a better grappler. I feel like I can win this fight standing or on the ground, uh, and as long as I don't leave an opening for him, I don't believe that he can create the opening to beat me. Well, his biggest advantage might just simply be the number of fights he's had. He's got twice as many fights total, wins and losses combined, as you do. So you, that's that's one thing you always have to be wary of, is going against a veteran. Exactly. Um, being up here in the Northwest, more areas now are doing amateur fights, but I had, you know, 12 amateur fights and, you know, hundreds of wrestling matches, so he might have more, you know, professional fights on his record, but, you know, I have more combat sports, fights on my record, if you will. So, a little bit of experience to him, but I'm not worried about that. Well, yeah, that's like what Ronda Rousey always says about her background in the Olympics in judo. It's like, why should I sweat a UFC fight when I've already had thousands of fights? Exactly. <laughs> you said you thrive under the big lights, so I'm sure being in the Kobe and Go Fight Live is just natural for you at this point. Yeah, it is. I, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Co-main event is almost better than main event. As soon as the main event's done, everyone leaves right away so they don't get to hear you thanking all your sponsors. So co-main event's almost the best spot for me. So that way it gets the most, uh, you know, eyes on me. Get to thank all my sponsors when I'm out there. Get to drive people towards those companies that are supporting me. So it really, it's a benefit almost to be co-main event rather than the main event. Well, speaking of which, I, I do want to give you that opportunity because people are going to hear this later on along with reading the articles. So if you want to thank some of those sponsors, feel free to go ahead at this time. Oh, man, there's a ton of them. Uh, Detroit Royalty is actually right up here in Vancouver. So they've been great. You know, they, they bring me into the warehouse. They, they take care of me as far as apparel, training gear, fight shorts, uh, karma fight gear, infinite wake, which is a, uh, a wakeboarding or a wake surfing company. 311 Tactical Solutions, Trauma Fight Gear, um, Devil's Playground Apparel, BC Excavation, uh, Crow's Automotive Sales, gosh darn it, I know I'm going to forget a couple, Royal Barbers, Max Muscle, um, Gladiator MMA, Rose City Fitness, 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu, uh, my management company and agency, uh, Iridium Sports with Jason House, Stephen Valentine. Gosh, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for this one. Hula Boy, excellent, excellent Hawaiian food. And, you know, I, I believe that's it. Uh, but, yeah, I uh, hope everyone can head up Go Fight Live, gfl.tv, and watch it. It'd be uh, a really good time. Oh, also, I forgot, uh, South Pacific Rum Bar, they're hosting my after party, and uh, Eccentric, they're a, uh, an exercise equipment company that's doing a lot of big things. All right, well, if there's any that we left out, they'll get to hear the rest of them after the fight on GFL TV. So I'm sure that you've covered all the bases, but just leave that out there that if you missed anybody, they'll get to see it after you get the win, right? Absolutely, and, you know, uh, always looking for more followers on Twitter, uh, at Austin Springer, and on my Instagram, Austin Springer MMA. All right, well, just one more question I want to ask before we wrap it up, since uh, you've won in every conceivable way, decision, submission, TKO. What's your favorite method, and or what method would you like to finish Mulvey Hill with? Uh, I think the, the most fun is, you know, the knockouts. Uh, anybody can get caught in a submission. You can, that person has the excuse to say, oh, I made a mistake, I got caught. But when it's a knockout or a, a TKO, it's a very definitive, you lost. And so I'll take any victory I can get. Uh, absolutely prefer a finish. I don't want it to go to a decision. I want it to be an exciting fight. Uh, whether it be a submission or a TKO, I'm hoping to leave with a, uh, a finish regardless. All right. Well, your last two fights were TKO finishes, so maybe this will be three in a row on Saturday night. We'll just have to wait and see. Sounds good. If it's a TKO, I'm hoping for a body shot. <laughs> liver punch right old boss root style oh, I love it I love it that's what the last one was the last one was actually a, a right hook to the kidneys that put him down so I'm hoping the left hook to the liver this time well the photo the publicity photo I got shows you throwing kick that looks just as nasty as a liver punch so I'm assuming <laughs> you could knock him out with a kick to the same spot 
Hey, well, I'll take what I can get. All right. Well, Austin, thanks for the time today. Looking forward to the fight this Saturday on GoFightLive.tv. So have a good one, and uh, hopefully be talking to you again in the future. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.